what is it that Our Lady wants the most? I assume the recitation of the rosary, correct? And she smiled and looked at him and said, no, 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 what Our Lady wants most is for people to become holy. Okay. That's what the Fatima message is all about. Reciting the rosary, wearing the brown scapular, you know, participating in Eucharistic adoration, these are all the means by which we become holy. But this is why we as an apostle have promoted this for, in our case, 72 years, and of course the Fatima message being 102 years old. So the 20th century will always be defined by Fatima and the prophetic messages given across the street from here 102 years ago, no doubt. Our Lady stood before these three uneducated shepherd children and gave them a message of warning and a message of hope. A message that the proud and mighty would need to understand and accept. You know, it was, it was and is this message that God wishes us to, to adhere more committedly to the Gospels. It is the Catholic faith, to our Catholic faith and our Christian faith, which builds society, which is what has given us the great prosperity and everything else we do have, particularly in the West. But it's, it's all part of the structure given to us by the Catholic Church and by Christianity in general and our, our vision you know, of what a society would be. But she warned us that we're, if we continued down this path of self-determination, which we were so bound on, it would lead us to ruin. So many followed her prescriptions, solving certain things and maybe think, keeping some things, terrible things from happening. But many, many rejected her warnings. You know, others you know, just didn't take it seriously at all. In general, we did fail to embrace the mission given to us from May to October in 1917. The church had always been looked at as the rock in unstable ground, okay? An island of stability in a sea of rough waters, we know that. Thou art Peter the rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Prevail is a good word, because it doesn't mean that the gates of hell will not attack and have successes. And it happens and has happened so many times throughout history. As you get into the latter part of the 19th century, Pope Leo XIII, and then beyond that, Pope Pius X, they saw the storm clouds on the horizon and wrote encyclicals of warning for people to see what was coming. Pope Benedict XV and Pope Pius XI saw the bitter fruits of this worldwide revolution that was taking hold in the world. Pius XII carried the load of a world in turmoil and understood this and the magnitude of his mission. The Fatima message was unfolding around him and he stood firm, surrounded by tyrants. The warnings are, lady, that if my requests are not heeded, and a number of things could happen, primarily Russia would spread her errors. Okay. Other forms of tyranny would come forward. Obviously, the, what happened in World War II. You see, the message had been given to the seemingly insignificant people, three shepherd children, Carrying out what she asked would fall to all, including those in positions of importance. Pope Pius XII humbled himself to take to heart what the children brought. The Holy Father will have much to suffer, they were told. Pope Pius XII suffered a white martyrdom as he worked to protect the church during a time of occupation. You know, I, 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 almost, I laugh when I think of people saying, he didn't do enough. It was occupied, he was an occupied territory. What he did is amazing in reality when you look at what he did from where he did it, you know. He worked hard to protect the victims of hatred who had been targeted for persecution and extermination. We know that. His proactive protection of the Jews particularly was notable, directing many on his, under his authority to put themselves in the very institution of the church in jeopardy by these actions, a most Christ-like action in seemingly impossible times. The praise of him by Jewish leaders were too numerous to have later been subject to revisionist history. The acts of mercy were too real to be ignored. Some years back, I was, uh, and I see her, she'll, her name will pop up in some of the later PowerPoint, Sister uh, Margarita Marchioni of the, of the uh, Sisters of St. Lucy Filippini had written books in defense of Pius XII, you know of her works, I'm sure. And I had her in Chicago on a radio show, and it was, it was interesting because this was in 2000, and we, we did the interview, I think it was the second week of November, and 
all of you who may recall, especially Americans, that was during the disputed George Bush Al Gore presidential recount. And so every day our interview kept getting delayed and then the next day and the next day and the next day. But, it, it, but when it finally went, there was great response to it. Sister wrote a great defense of Pius XII. I have to say though, our, our friend Father Michael Saharic is here and Father, Father is our pastor from St. Anne's Parish, which is very near our shrine in New Jersey. And our pastor, I gotta put in a good word for him, but, uh, but Father in his, his thesis at, um, at Mount St. Mary's Seminary wrote a tremendous defense of Pius XII. Actually, you should be giving this talk, not me. You know? <laughs> but it's beautiful. But the bottom line is this, you know, we have, we had a Pope who kept this church intact during times that people didn't realize, okay? You know, uh, keep in mind, you know, in those days, we did not have the internet. We did, we had very little media. And the media that we had, let's be realistic, was controlled. Look where it was coming from. And, and despite that, I mean, his actions were heroic, very heroic. And I think we always have to remember that, you know? Coming back to Fatima, here at Fatima, Our Lady had called for devotion to her Immaculate Heart. This began in the June apparition. Well, the encyclical that Pope, Pope Pius XII wrote, Achille Regnum, the doctrine is that the queenship of Mary is about the queenship of Mary. And the devotion is to what? Consecration to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. Any doubt that Pope Pius XII was a Fatima Pope, I think can be dispelled by that very act right there. He did bring about the fact that we do honor her and her queenship. Pope John Paul II, Saint Pope John Paul II is often referred to as the Fatima Pope, and he is, very much so. But Pope Pius XII laid the groundwork for this by acknowledging the mission that Our Lady gave and by working tirelessly to preserve the institution of the church. No doubt the real target of the evil of the 20th century of communism, what is, what is the essence? It's the atheism behind there. This, is, this was really the enemy is the Catholic Church and churches and society in general who, who proclaim a God, proclaim our God, okay? When the, when the Russians came to power, the Bolsheviks, I should say, came to power in Russia in 1917, they were bringing about, finally, the elimination of God. And it didn't just happen in Russia at that point. As an American, I'm ashamed to say that the same thing happened just south of our border in Mexico. But it wasn't looked at them. I think for economic reasons, it was ignored to a very great degree. We heard about the errors of Russia. We heard about the atrocities in Russia. We didn't see what was happening right next door. It wasn't until the 20s when the Cristero War came out that you saw what actually had happened during that time in the persecutions of Catholics, which to this day, I don't know if anybody's here from Mexico, but we know that the church in Mexico has suffered for 100 years under this because it, it, it diminished so much their power to be a part of society. And that's the key to it. We hear today politicians in our country, and you do in your own countries, talk about, well, you have the freedom to worship. No, no, no. Freedom to worship is not freedom of religion. If religion cannot be in the public square and form society, then it's really not, it's not accomplishing what it has to be. It is, when you look at, look at the, the, the Edict of Milan, look at what happened afterwards when, when Constantine legalized Christianity. Look at how society formed. And this is what it's all about. We have to influence, we have to stand out there. And all these things that are happening out there in the world, legislation in our country is becoming horrible. And in every one of your countries, it's the same thing, unfortunately. Our Christianity is being diminished. They want to relegate our beliefs to the history books right now. Pius XII saw this very profoundly. And when people act as if he didn't take a proactive stand on so many things, in the situation he was in, he was the rock. He was a rock who kept the church intact during a time when it was, it was, it looked to be going to extinction, you know. Um, you know, Carlos touched on our founder and his connections with the Holy See and, and the blessings of Saint, uh, uh, or excuse me, Apostle Pope Pius XII. I say Saint because we're working towards it. We're still praying for all of this and it will happen. I truly believe it'll happen in our lifetime. I, I'm hoping, I truly believe so because his works just cannot be ignored. You know, we have, uh, if you, I'm going back over here, I'm going to turn this back. Uh, you saw that first slide. This slide here, I want to see that beautiful statue of Our Lady. This is the International Pilgrim Virgin statue blessed by Pope Pius XII in 1947. This statue has been touring continuously for 72 years, okay, going around. It's been to 
It's been to 100 countries around the world. It's been all around the United States, now particularly in these last years. What you're looking at here is an initiative we just had. We just completed a tour of the 21 missions of California. Now, those of you, if you're Spanish, you might you, you would know about this, the, the Portela expedition, where St. Junipero Serra and the priest brought to the United States the Catholic faith in California. And from San Diego up to San Francisco, they founded 21 missions. So we had, we had uh, to, to celebrate the 250th anniversary of that occurrence, we had this, this um, we had the image out there. I was honored to be there for several days. We were visiting all the spots, the missions of St. Junipero Serra. You can see that the um, Knights of Columbus, these are, these are the Knights on bikes, okay? The Knights, the Knights of Columbus have all different look. These are the, they, they escorted our motor home uh, with their motorcycles all around. And if you look on the bottom right on September 11th, which is a day that really holds for us a lot of meaning, at noon on September 11th, we held a rally on the steps of the Capitol building in Sacramento, California. And we did, we selected California to really highlight what's going on. It's going on all around the United States and it's going on in all your countries too, the way all of our Christian laws and such are just being just discarded, you know, every time. California makes sense. San Diego, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Sacramento. Where do these names come from? These are all Catholic places, just like the show the holy places of Europe. I mean, my family's Italian, and we, you know, I, I think of I think of the, the, the you know the history that was brought by by the immigrants, my four grandparents and so many others that came to the United States. And what did they give us? Did they give us prosperity in the U.S.? Well, to a great degree, they did. And that was a, a product of coming and working in an environment where it was possible. And I'm happy with that. But more importantly, they brought the Catholic faith. And if, if, if they had come here and just, you know, gained prosperity, that was saying, what does it profit a man to gain the world and suffer the loss of his soul? And that's what I think was so important when, when the, the, my Italian family came, when my wife's family came from Poland, you know, they brought Catholicism and they brought Christianity and, a, and an ethic. And the work ethic, I think, that's made our economies and that so good and, and strong really has, it, it's an offshoot of, of living a Christian life. So I think this is what, what you know, Pope Pius XII saw the need to protect, to truly protect the, the institution and the society. And that is where I, I, I think, you know, when we get, when we look at Fatima, we know he was a Fatima Pope because he saw everything unfolding in front of him. You know, the children said, the church will have much to suffer. The Holy Father will have a lot to suffer. Pius XII suffered a white martyrdom, a difficult white martyrdom in his time, okay? And probably, you know, afterwards, certainly, I, I believe he's smiling in heaven, but what they've done to his reputation afterwards is just disgusting. I mean, and, and it was something that is quite insulting because, because it takes away from, from our, you know, the, the realities of what went on and what the Catholic Church is all about. And the reality of the Catholic Church and our, again, our Christian society did not, you know, we never abandon people. We don't do that. And the church doesn't do that. And Pius XII made sure that the church, even in times where there was great pressure, but what are they doing? They're also bringing the spiritual works, the works that will bring them to salvation, which is the true reason why our church exists. Okay, We are, this is the type of thing that, that the, why the institution of the church is so important. We have a, um, uh, we have a time here where we are, um, I think we look at things in too much of a material sense. I think that's what's, what's happening today. I think even in our church, I think so many religious orders and groups have lost their sense of mission when it comes to why they're founded. You know, I see, I see some orders, Father, you're here, Father Bing, and I, 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 I applaud what you do because the most important thing is bringing the prayer. Of course, it's through Our Lady. Our Lady will direct us in our spirituality. We as an apostolate do that. We are, we are again, we're, we're located in 70 some dioceses in the United States, 100 countries worldwide. We're part of the International Association. As I mentioned, Nuno and Anna here and others work so, so hard. But we have to fight in the public square to stand up and, and, and bring people to a knowledge of what Our Lady asked at Fatima. When she, when she 
told us of the things that were going on, told us that we needed to straighten out our lives. And Our Lady is not, you know, I, I love when people say, you know, Our Lady appeared and she looks sad. Well, you know, I, I don't think she could possibly be sad. You know, she has the highest place in heaven. Profoundly, she's sad when she sees us and she sees what we risk losing by not following what, what God gave us and what she warned us of at Fatima. So I, I think that we have to, um, uh, we have to look at, at why Our Lady comes when she comes to Fatima and other places. I don't speak of other apparitions because that's up to the church to decide their validity. But until we start straightening out who we are and, and what our, our responsibilities are, you know, I, I, a lot of people come on and say, well, you know, if the Pope would do this or if, if these people would do that, things would be better. But Our Lady didn't say to us, you know, are you willing to question what the authority of the church does? She didn't say that. She said, are you willing to offer your lives in prayer and reparation for the conversion of sinners, for the salvation of souls? That's what it's all about, okay? You know, how many feet away from here, those of you who believe in the Fatima message, and I assume everybody sitting here does, you know, Our Lady opened up the earth and she showed what? She showed the vision of hell, okay? And what did she say? She said, you've seen hell where the souls of poor sinners go. She said, are you willing to offer your lives in prayer and reparation so people will avoid this fate? It was as simple as that, okay? She didn't do it to be sensational. She didn't do it for any other, she didn't do it to scare the children, although it did. But really it didn't because they knew that they were in God's grace. It, it scared them deeply. It, 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 it scar, I would say scarred them, but it impressed them to the point where they knew their mission. You know, this is what the mission of Fatima was. You know, the Angel of Peace appeared three times to the children in 1916, which Sister Lucia would later say, were the most important messages of Fatima because she said without that, they wouldn't have been spiritually formed. And they were also given the prayers of adoration and the foundation of the Fatima message, which is what? Eucharistic reparation, okay? That's what this is all about. We are to become people of prayer because by being people of prayer, we will bring that forth to others. We always say, learn, live, and then spread the message of Fatima because it is a message more relevant today than it was in 1917. And those are not my words. Those are the words of a canonized saint, Pope John Paul II, okay? Learn, live, and spread the message because it is more relevant today. We are living in the times we were warned of. Pope Pius XII was living in the times as they developed. He saw it coming and he stood as the captain of a ship that was being rocked by terrible seas. But can you imagine perhaps the things that came after him? We credit Pope John Paul II, the consecration in 1984, and all this stuff, all beautiful. But would that have happened if Pope Pius XII had not stayed firm, kept the church intact, stayed strong so that his successors can take it when we got back into peacetime? You know, war is a terrible thing. Our Lady said right here, World War I was raging at the time. And she said, this war will end soon. But if my requests are not heeded, another greater war will come. History is what it is. The history of the 20th century and the early part of the 21st century speaks for itself. Okay. More people have been martyred for the faith in the last 100 years than in all of Christianity combined in the 1900 years of Christianity combined, more people in the last 100 years. And these are people that we, we can document, know about. Now look at the other, the other issue here. What, what have we done in, in, in our time? You know, we talk about nations being annihilated. Our Lady said this could happen. Nations could be annihilated. Oh my God, in 1947, when our founder came up and called for a blue army of prayer to counter the red army of atheistic communism, because everybody saw two years earlier the atom bomb be detonated. And they saw the devastation of what, by today's standards, is a firecracker. Okay, think about that. And, and people knew nations could be annihilated, but then we forgot something. Our nations being annihilated? Look at contraception and abortion. Do you realize that one and a half billion people, one and a half billion children have been aborted in the last 50 years worldwide? That's 20% of the present population of the earth, okay? If we took 20% of you sitting here and just took you out and executed you, how would that affect you today? How would it affect the rest of the people sitting here, okay? 
Think about that. But see, we don't do it. We don't do it with war blowing people up. We don't have extermination chambers. We don't have Auschwitz or anything like that. What we have is clean surgical things, you know. Think about that. This is where we've come. And this is why the Fatima message today is even so much more important than it was because, because yeah, the communists did leave Russia. There's no doubt about it. But did they, did they have to be there anymore? You know, worldwide communism, worldwide atheism had taken root. And in, no stronger than it has in my own country and all the countries of the West. Look at, look at the standards that we live by now in the West that would be unthinkable 50 years ago. Look what we allow. Look at the things that were hidden and then became ignored and then became tolerated and now institutionalized. Think about all that. And I don't just, I'm, not, I'm not casting dispersions on any individual or any people, but the church is a moral authority, okay? And Pius XII was that moral authority. And maybe perhaps that's why today he's not looked at with a lot of smiles. You know, think about that. You know, it's easy to love, love the, the, the one that hugs you and makes you feel good. And right, Father's smiling. And he's right. But yeah, it's true. I mean, we love to hear. I mean, if you want that, come to my city. I mean, we're, we're living in New Jersey, but we're from Chicago. I can take you to 20 places where the, we call them the happy. There's one called the happy church not far from us. What does that tell you? Everybody goes on Sunday and they, you know, they get up 10 o'clock after brunch, or whatever, and then they go over to the happy church for a couple hours and they hear nice things and they walk out happy. Do they walk out sanctified? Do they, do they, do they go out to the world? You know, the mass is ended, go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Okay. That's what we hear at the end of the mass. Okay. Do you hear that in those places? No, you don't. You know, you hear good things, make you feel maybe it'll have a movie, and it's all fine. And those things, I mean, I guess could be okay, but are we really living? Are you really getting anything out? This is where we're at today in our society. The West is, is probably, and, and I say mea culpa because so much garbage comes out of the United States, especially California, which is one of the reasons why we selected California to be in. You know, look at Hollywood, look at this stuff. It's not the only place, you know. But, and, and for every bit of evil that comes out, you know, no one is ever able to sin for you. You have to accept it and do that. And that's really what it's all about. But we have to change society so these things don't come out this way, okay? So that, that people see that we are a, a, a people of God. This is, you know, Pius XII. I, and I, I've always had great respect. I was born during his pontificate. I'm 50, I'm, I'm 64. So he, he, was, he died three years after I was born. So I guess you identify with the Pope that, who was there when you were born. Like, I think there's something to say about that. And I do, I do know that, that my training, my family, were very much steeped in the, in the spirituality of Pope Pius XII and his predecessors, and even his successors. I mean, you know, I, 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 a lot of times people want to beat up some of the popes that came afterwards. To a degree, they were victims of their times too, but you need to be courageous. I'm not gonna stand here and, and you know, why we talk about the consecration of Russia, why wasn't it done during the time of Pius XI, when Pius XII did the consecration in 1942, you know, it, it, our, it, you know, Lucia said that it wasn't what Our Lady wanted, but, but she said, it did shorten World War II, it did shorten war. So everything we do, Later on, you know, we build, our society builds one beyond the other. So anyway, you know, the Fatima message tells us nothing more than to listen to his words and follow his commands, you know. You know, again, this idea of replacing, you know, liberty, you know, with, with this idea of, of doing whatever you want. That's what's happened, you know, this idea of religious liberty, religious freedom has now become liberty to do what you want. That's not what it's all about, you know. We are people of God, those 10 commandments that Moses brought down, they were done in stone for a reason. They're not supposed to be erased, okay? What he brought down there has gone through the Old Testament, come into the New Testament. This is how we're supposed to live. And take the, you know, and, and, and we have to love our neighbor enough to want them to succeed and want them to be holy, okay? You know, the last thing Moses said to the promise, to, to the Israelites as they crossed into the promised land was love the God, the Lord your God with your whole heart and your whole soul and with all your might. And our Lord later added, <clears throat> and love your neighbor as yourself for the love of God, okay? That's the charity we must live with. We as people who promote the message of Fatima, you know, we have to get, we have to help those we love, for, we have to save ourselves first, 
then we have to save, you know, help to save our spouses, our parents, our siblings, the people we like. Now comes a tough one. How about the people you don't like? Okay, everybody think you're someone you really don't like. Would you stop and say a prayer for them today? Because that's really important. And this is the problem. People look at a politician and say, I can't pray for him or her. Well, maybe you need to, and maybe they would be different and they would see it differently. And I think this is what, Pi, in, in, in wrapping up, it's what Pius XII, kept us as Christians, as Catholics to do, to stay on message, okay? Christ gave us a mission 2,000 years ago. Our Lady reiterated it at Fatima, you know. Pius XII knew this and directed the church with this in mind, you know. Thou art Peter the rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Never forget that. Thank you. That was